What exactly is a look? Everyone seems to have their own definition, but I'd like you to try mine. A look is a set of creative adjustments that stays the same across every shot in our timeline. This is a vital ingredient in any color grade, and it's one that should be tailored to each project that we tackle. But color grading and look creation, while they may have some things in common, are actually fundamentally different tasks. It's sort of like the difference between playing a guitar and building a guitar. Now, if you're not ready to start building your own guitar, you still need to be able to pick out and to customize the right instrument for your creative needs. That's what we're gonna talk about today. That's what we're gonna look at here inside of Resolve. So I have a brand new project here that thus far I have done no grading in whatsoever. I haven't really begun to work. The only thing that I have done is the first thing that I will always do in a new project, which is to set up my color management, meaning that overall technical journey from what the camera saw to what my display can reproduce. Now, if you're not familiar with color management, you wanna learn more about it, you're in luck. I talk about color management all the time here on the channel. Lots of great content to get into there. A great place to start would be my DaVinci Wide Gamut Workflow series, where I will show you the exact color management that I'm using here in this project today. For today, we're gonna to stay focused on what we can do with our looks, and we're gonna rest upon that foundation of basic color management, okay? So here inside of this project, let's talk about what would come next in the process. So as we've said, we've set up our color management, but I'm now actually not ready to begin doing my shot level grading. There's another step that I wanna take before that, and that is to set up my look or my macro level creative transform. Now, this look can come in a number of different forms. It can be in a plugin. It could be implemented in more than one way. What we're gonna to do today, however, is we're going to use a LUT, and we're gonna make sure that we select the right kind of LUT, okay? So let's go over here to our LUTs folder, and talk about how we can go about selecting LUTs. So the first thing that we need to understand about our setup here is that we're in a color managed environment, as we already discussed. And we also need to know that we are working in the DaVinci wide gamut intermediate space. Why is that important? Because any LUT that you are ever going to use was set up to expect a particular color space, and it was set up to return a particular color space, and you have to meet that LUT on its terms. That LUT will not come to you, okay? So you need to know what that LUT expects and what it's going to give you back, and you, of course, also need to know what you have to give to that LUT and what you're gonna need back from that LUT. So what we need in our case, because we are working color managed and our working color space is DaVinci Wide Gamut Intermediate, we need a LUT that will take DaVinci Wide Gamut Intermediate in and will return DaVinci Wide Gamut Intermediate as well, because I don't need a LUT that's gonna do any technical transforms for me. My color management is taking care of all of my technical transforms. I want a LUT that is solely going to make a creative transformation of my image. Lucky enough, here inside of my CKC subfolder in my LUTs folder, and then inside of the PFE subfolder there, I have my 2383 DWG to DWG V2 LUT, which is exactly uh, in line with what we just talked about. This is the perfect type of LUT for my application here. This LUT is available for free. There's a link to it in the description for this video, okay? So what I'm gonna do, because I actually want to apply this LUT not to one shot, but to all of the shots in my timeline, I'm not gonna drop it into the clip level of my node graph here. Rather, I'm gonna go to this drop down menu here, and I'm gonna select Timeline. This is another section of my node graph where anything that I place within it is going to affect all of the shots in my timeline simultaneously, and it's going to affect all of those shots dead last. So whatever other grading I eventually will do on each of these individual shots is going to feed into that final creative transform just before it goes through its final display transform that's being handled by my color management, okay? So we're gonna implement our LUT here at the timeline level. And let's double click this 2383 DWG to DWG V2 LUT. By the way, DWG to DWG, that stands for DaVinci Wide Gamut to DaVinci Wide Gamut. So I know this LUT is gonna do exactly what I need. It will take DaVinci Wide Gamut and it will give me back DaVinci Wide Gamut. That's exactly what I'm looking for, okay? So I've dropped this on here. And if I was happy with what I was looking at, if there was nothing that I wanted to change and I thought it looked perfect as is, I could indeed begin to grade from here. But we talked a moment ago about when we are not building our own guitar, we still need to be able to customize our instrument to some extent, right? And in this case, as I'm flipping through these images and looking at the way that this LUT treats them, I feel that it might be a little bold. It might be a little far. I might wanna tune this a little bit off of the 
stock rendering that I'm getting out of this LUT. And I wanna talk about a couple ways that we can go about that, all right? So the first thing that I wanna show you is if we go over here to our key palette, and then I go down here to the key output section, let's look at this gain setting right here and watch what happens if I turn it to zero. If I turn that to zero and I enable disable this node like I was doing a moment ago, you can see nothing's happening whatsoever. Why? Because I have effectively set the opacity of this node, the effect of this node to 0% strength. So it's having no influence on the image whatsoever at the moment. And if I wanted to have say 50% strength, I could go to 0.5. And I've now scaled everything that this LUT is doing back by 50%. This can be really handy, especially actually with a bolder LUT like this 2383 film print LUT that I'm working with. It's a rather bold LUT. It's got quite a bit of contrast to it. It's got quite a bit of character to it. And oftentimes all that we need to do is just scale everything back a little bit to get the desired effect. We maybe don't need the entirety of the LUT at its full strength, okay? So that's idea number one. You can just play with your key output gain and sort of modulate that to your taste. And you know, this shot is a great example. When I look at this at 100%, the shadows around my subject's hair are really just starting to feel kind of lifeless and dead. Whereas if I scale this back to around 50%, I've still got some nice, bold, snappy contrast and some nice color rendition, but I've backed off on the overall strength enough to begin to discern some details in those areas, okay? Let's talk about another strategy though, because what I've just done here is in addition to scaling back what I might've felt was some overly bold contrast, I've also scaled back whatever color effects I was getting out of this LUT as well. So desirable things, such as if I reset this here, you know, some desirable characteristics, such as a uh, kind of deepening in my reds and the way that my saturations and my hues are shifting around, those things are being scaled back as well, when perhaps all I really wanna do is pull back the contrast. I wanna talk about a couple strategies for when that scenario arises. Let's prepend a node to node number one here. I'm gonna hit Shift S to do that. And what I now wanna do is go over to my contrast knob and I can just work it in a negative direction and start to open up contrast underneath the LUT. This is totally fair game. This is not cheating. This isn't a hack. You are absolutely free to do this. This is a great strategy for getting a little bit of contrast out of your LUT while preserving the character of the color changes that you're seeing. The only tweak that I wanna to offer to you is this. When you are making a contrast adjustment at the sort of global level or at the macro level, we want to be mindful to preserve middle gray, meaning the middle exposure as contemplated by the production team and as is being reproduced by our image. We wanna make sure that we are not biasing or bumping that at the global scale. Ultimately, when we get into shot level grading, we can place exposure wherever we creatively want to, but at this level, we don't necessarily wanna bias it in one direction or another. How do we ensure we're not doing that? We make sure that we are pivoting around the middle gray of whatever color space we are working in. Now, what color space are we working in? Da Vinci Wide Gamut Intermediate. What's the pivot point of mid gray in the Da Vinci Wide Gamut Intermediate space? I don't remember. You probably don't remember either if you ever knew at all. Lucky enough, we have my mid gray cheat sheet that can help us with this. This is also a free download available in a link uh, or available in a link uh, for today's video. If you take a look in uh, this, in this uh, table here, we can find Da Vinci Intermediate, and we can look in this normalized zero to one column for this 0.336 value. So what this means is that if I set my pivot back in Resolve to 0.336, I'm going to be pivoting around the middle gray point of my working color space. And what that means is that as I reduce contrast, I will not be reducing or moving, I should say, my exposure up or down. So I'll be preserving my middle gray, okay? So that's the idea here. If you just wanna scale back your contrast and keep your color intact, you can do that by pulling your contrast in a negative direction, and then by setting your pivot to align with the mid-gray point of whatever space you're working in. If that's Da Vinci Wide Gamut Intermediate, it's 0.336, but regardless of the space you're working in, grab that mid-gray cheat sheet and then you'll have it handy for the next time that you wanna make this type of adjustment. There's one final strategy I wanna show you for customizing or tailoring a LUT so that it best serves your purposes here inside of the node graph. I'm gonna delete this contrast adjustment node and we are gonna create a layer mixer node now. I'm gonna do this by hitting option L. And I'm now gonna change my composite mode. I'm gonna right click on this layer mixer itself and I'm gonna set my composite mode to color. 
And then there's one more thing I want to do. I'm going to take this node up here and I'm going to hit Command C. Okay. Then I'm going to tap toad number, node number two and I'm going to hit Command V, like so. So right now I'm seeing exactly what I was looking at a moment ago before I did all this fancy business with the layer mixer and with copying and pasting the nodes. Nothing has changed. However, if we go back to that very first trick that we looked at a couple minutes ago of scaling back our key output gain, we now have independent control over two different aspects of our image. So I'm now controlling just the contrast of my image, similar to what I was trying to do a moment ago with that dedicated node. I'm now controlling it with my layer mixer and I am preserving my color transformations underneath, okay? So if we scale it in this direction, you can see how that's taking place. Here's the other fun part though. If I go down to node number two and I do that same exercise, I'm now scaling back the color adjustments. So it could be that all I want is the contrast adjustment out of this LUT and I don't wanna get any of the color remapping or I only wanna get some of it. This layer mixer with the composite mode set to color is a really good way of accomplishing that. It allows you to have individualized control over the luminance or contrast component of the LUT versus the color component of the LUT. And these three strategies that I've shown you here today can go so far for you in terms of really tailoring a LUT that you may like that may serve your uh, project well for the overall look you're trying to create, but which you wanna tailor or tune a little bit to the particular project you're tackling. These three strategies alone can take you a very long way toward that. And as a nice kicker, everything that we just started talking about, this is actually the perfect introduction to beginning to build your own guitar. So if you are interested in that, if you're interested in getting into look creation and look development and doing so in a more robust way and ultimately building up your own transforms from scratch like I do, like I did here with this 2383 LUT, this is a great way to begin because you're starting to understand important concepts such as preserving middle gray when you are designing a look, such as the way that the math of uh, different blending modes causes these layers to interact, you've really started to get your toes wet into that portion of uh, the creative process, the creative color grading world. But regardless, even if you decide never to build your own guitar, you've now got some more tools in your arsenal for customizing an instrument that you have already selected for use in whatever project you're grading. So I hope you guys find this interesting. Let me know if so in the comments, and then we're gonna talk about this in a bit more depth this Friday in grade school. See you then.